Don't worry about the sodium. If anything, I urge you to add more sodium because that's how you're going to have more energy. It's actually a great pre-workout when you're doing carnivore or yeah. keto even. Yeah, exactly. it gives, uh, yeah, it leads your body to retain also the water. And so when you have more water in your body, so your blood volume goes back up again and fills your blood vessels. So your blood pressure goes to a normal range. So not too high, but not too low. And that is going to give you energy and you're not going to feel lethargic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the SupersetYourLife.com podcast. This is your weekly dose of entertainment, education, and inspiration to fuel your life inside and beyond the gym. And if you listen through to the entire episode at the end, we will announce a very special discount code exclusive to podcast listeners that you can use on anything on our website. And a quick reminder before we get started, if you look down below, you will see three items. You will see a thumbs up, which is like, you will see an arrow, which means share, and you will see a subscribe link. So I'm asking you to please smash that like button. If you really don't like this episode, you can always change it to a thumbs down later. We're probably going to get a couple of those because we're talking about the carnivore diet and eating meat and how much more beneficial that is than a plant-based diet. So yeah, we're probably going to get a couple of those. But I'm promising you that if you are really truthfully looking for answers to your health problems, a meat-based diet is going to be really key for you, okay? So listen to what Dr. Sarah has to say on this. I believe it's going to be life-changing for you. And while you're at it, think of somebody else that you know that could really benefit from what Dr. Sarah has to say and go ahead and share it with them, please, okay? After you hit the subscribe button so that you don't miss more content around carnivore diets, around low-carb, around uh, competing on a low-carb diet, looking your best, feeling your best, supersetting your life, hit that subscribe button and you will see a bell icon that shows up after you hit subscribe. If you hit that bell icon, you will be notified when more episodes are available. We have one every single Saturday morning, okay? That's our hard work and our promise to you guys. Let's get into it right now. Here is Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. Yep. Welcome, everybody, to episode 91 of the SupersetYourLife.com podcast. Today, we have Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. She is a nutrition professor at Miami-Dade College. She earned her PhD in exercise physiology and nutrition at the University of Miami. Dr. Sarah is another carnivore success story herself. You can check out her YouTube channel. We've been binging it like all morning. <laughs> got some good questions that we're going to ask and uh, can't wait to see what she says. But she's got a ton of education and practical helps on the carnivore diet. You can check out her YouTube channel. We'll put a link to all these in the description. But it is Dr. Sarah Zaldivar. Instagram is dr.sarah.zaldivar. Email. We're going to put links to those in the show notes. And so... Dr. Sarah, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Cole. Thank you guys for having me. I'm very excited. Thank you. We're excited to have you. Yay. Yep. As much as I want to dive into the questions right away, would you please just share, like, how did this carnival lifestyle begin for you? Hmm. Well, it really didn't begin with carnivore. It began a very long time ago when I was 18 around yeah 18 i guess you could say is when i started really um getting bothered by acne that i was having mm. and i tried every single treatment under the sun i did antibiotics i did birth control pills i did spironolactone for two years i did accutane twice oh, did it, nothing worked yes and um I was at my wit's end. As a matter of fact, Accutane made it worse. For the first time in my life, I started having cystic acne, you know, and then I would pick at them and then I it would leave scars and I wouldn't leave the house and I would cry and it was, it was very traumatic. Yeah. So that started me on the whole functional medicine and just going against the mainstream because um, I had first-hand experience that mainstream conventional medicine just does not work um, because I saw all the dermatologists and all they would do is see you for a few minutes and um, 
I, I was also, even with that, I was doing all the research and I would literally go and tell them, this is what I've done. This is what I think is happening. Like I, even with that, I would feed them the science and then I would tell them what they need to give me because I still believe that it's a drug that was going to heal my skin and, and they would oblige, you know? And, but eventually, you know, after I exhausted every option available, the only thing that worked was spironolactone, but it really just because it mimicked a low carb environment. Um, but then it, it messed up my hormones. And like, I, I had no DHEA to speak of, which is similar to a form of testosterone in your body. So, yeah. um, when, when I realized what was happening, I freaked out and I just quit it that same day. And so from there, I, uh, because I literally had no more options, conventional medicine just didn't know what to do with me anymore. And so I, um, every time I'm, I'm a big nerd, I read a lot and I watch a lot of documentaries and things like that. So after I was put in that situation, plus weight struggles, I guess that's another major thing. Um, I would, every time something like that would happen and I would be at my wits end, I would go and buy all the books and, and do all my research. And then once I find some new idea, I'm like, okay, now we're going to try this, you know? And it was a cycle. I would try so many different things. So first thing that worked was a paleo diet. Mm -hmm. Um, I read the diet cure by Dr. Lauren Cordain and it worked. It definitely cleared up my skin like no other drug could, but I, but not as much as keto. So that was my introduction to paleo from there i realized well if i do keto then it gets even better and then keto it was a problem for me because i have a lot of like we spoke on our interview last time called mm -hmm. eating disorder sugar addiction yep. um i've struggled with depression suicidal mm -hmm. ideation um very serious attempts which i've spoken about in um an interview like a couple of weeks ago, but let's not get into that. The point is it was very, um, like my, like my mental health is also another big factor, you know? So, yeah. And that you see that a lot also, by the way, mental health with, um, with sugar addiction, because it literally messes the neurochemistry in your brain and your dopamine receptors and all that stuff. So yeah. from there, um i uh realized that it wasn't working because i was still getting all of the sweet keto stuff i'm still binging on keto stuff i'm i still have cravings i'm still struggling and i'm doing all these things and waking up at four o'clock in the morning and killing myself working out and doing all those things and i get i would get results but then i would literally undo them in a few days just of eating whatever it's so easy to undo the the everything you worked for and so that is eventually what brought me to carnivore carnivore literally wipes out the cravings because if you're not eating addictive foods then you don't suffer the withdrawal stage of addiction which yeah. is when you have cravings right you do the the abstinence part will if will basically clear your cravings now it doesn't mean you will never feel cravings. That's not realistic. We have deep rooted, you know, habits and um, like things we do with food when we get stressed or emotional yeah. and, and that's fine. But compared to how frequent it was when I would still include carbs and I would still do um, uh, keto, but sweet stuff, you know, that trigger just stayed there for me and it just made it I, I just had to work so much harder to benefit you know so yeah. that's why i do carnivore wow thank you so much for that you I, have question. Well, I was just curious when you were on keto did you do like a dirty keto so you were still eating like the sugar alcohol and oopsie yeah and just like yeah i would substitute yeah i would i and i would uh, you know, I, I, there was even a phase, like if you go back to my YouTube channel, I, I, I have a whole playlist of keto desserts <laughs> that I would do. And I would pump out those recipes and I would learn how to make them. And yeah. it's very dangerous to, to learn how, what you can do with almond flour and stevia, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I, not like I wanted to do dirty keto, but it ended up being that way because I would always have the cravings and I would just satisfy them with those foods. 
Totally. Yeah. And I was, we've been there scrolling through your playlist this morning and I saw was seeing all those thumbnails and I was like, yeah, I'm just going to keep scrolling. I'm getting hungry looking at those. So. <laughs> I know it's a trigger. <laughs> well, even Before. like a few weeks ago, was that for mother's day, right? Or Easter I made like strawberries and cream. And then with, I made some keto biscuits and then mm-hmm. you know, put the strawberries and the whipped cream on top. And even that was like, you know, we had, I think it was like almond flour and a little bit of like stevia. But it's it can be triggering. I mean, and the oh, whipped cream I, I, is yeah. for sure triggering. I ate the entire thing. There was we didn't have any leftovers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So yeah, I think it looks more restrictive when people hear about carnivore diets. They have a heart attack at first. It's like just meat, you know. But because they don't realize that it feels so freeing, they don't mm-hmm. they don't realize what state how beautiful it is to live in that state where you're not having energy crashes and cravings, yeah. um, mental clarity, you know, the brain fog, all all the, all the stuff. Well, um, and honestly, how easy it is to like live your life when all you're eating is meat. It's like meal prep is easier. Going out to eat is pretty darn easy. Like people think it's a, such a restrictive diet and like you can't live your life, yeah. but we found the complete opposite. It's just like that for a couple of days to get past those first couple of days. And I just, I wanted to interrupt you so many times, Dr. Sarah, in your story, because I was like, that's just like me. That's just like me. The same thing to me, same thing to me. I mean, same thing to both of us, but especially when yeah. we, cut, when we cut out like all the, all, the all, all, all the, process keto foods once we got past all that yes now it's like as somebody like you has i i don't know i'm I'm thinking that my eating disorder probably was quite a bit more severe but um it but regardless but i I don't know like i doubt it it. yeah well i mean i doubt doubt it was more severe than mine (laughs) well it's it's yeah. severe in both cases and an eating disorder, no eating is, disorder is, good. is is just flat out severe no matter um no no no, no, yeah. no matter what the circumstances are but um i can completely relate to you with the more that you are re- dialed in yeah restrictive to only to meat as your fuel source and not you know, you're not chewing gum all day and having the artificial sweeteners from yeah, from or the just flavored electrolytes. Yeah, pay attention. And, like now, it's the same. Yeah, uh-huh. and, and months and, and months ago, I was eating Quest bars and like all kinds of stuff. You know, like just dirt, dirty bulking or whatever. I was I was eating five, six hundred grams of protein a day and just like not really caring if extra carbs kind of came and went. But I was hungrier then than I am now. I'm eating half the calories now, three thousand calories a day on a show prep and feeling great and feeling satisfied because it's all like, it's literally just bacon, eggs, keto bricks, and just, just, just real food. It's like, all right, like if every calorie matters, how can we get the most bang for our, like food's sacred when you start show prep, you know, but now it's just like, we've gone away with all the vegetables. We've gone away with all the stuff that our bodies don't need. And we're, and we feel just like you do. Like It feels great. (laughs) So much better. A a funny story. When I would do keto, I would do zoodles, zucchini noodles. There Mm -hmm. was a time where, you know, I'm just exploring all the keto foods and, um, it would kick me out of ketosis. I'd be like the most perfect adherence. And I knew for a fact that I should be in ketosis and I wasn't. And the only thing that was different is that I started doing those zoodles. Wow. The seeds and, you know, the whole, uh, everything in the zucchini. Gosh, even like the last year, the only vegetables we really ever ate was like cauliflower and then um, just salad. Just a couple things that agree with our body, but it's amazing how we take those out. And now my skin looks better. And now we have like, we're, we, yeah. we, we feel better even just getting bloated. rid of the small amount yeah. of worry yeah my husband um always ate meat he he's also a bodybuilder and when i first met him, <laughs> yeah yeah he is <laughs> it's like and he does it easy you know for him he doesn't even work out as much as i do like he'll just you know lift some weights uh. um and just he's uh, anyway, he's, he's great. <laughs> so he, um, when I first met him, he's always eaten meats only. And I would get into not fights, but you know, I'd be on his case. You need to eat your fruits and veggies. Like, how can you not eat vegetables? And he wouldn't listen to me. He's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> the only vegetable though, that he did eat was spinach, spinach leaves, like a bed of spinach. And then he would cook some meat every day when he would come home from work either chicken breast or turkey or, you know, any kind of meat, just protein, right? 
and dump that on top of the spinach, not even salad dressings. Like he doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and the only ailment that he ever complained about um, was low back pain, really bad low back pain. And we just thought it was because he was diagnosed with a bulging disc. Back in the 90s in Miami, there was a hurricane, I think Hurricane Andrew in 1995. Mm -hmm. My husband is 58, by the way. So just so you know, like he was already an adult back then. And this tree came, um, like it, it fell on his house and he was trying to move it away from his house and hurt literally hurt his back like that like he couldn't get up um and since then you know all the specialists at the university of miami the hospital jackson they're like you've got a bulging disc and that's the end of that you might need surgery and over time it just always bothered him to the point where it got to a point where he was like okay i cannot put off the surgery no matter how risky it is it's close to my spine and i don't want to do it but he can't get enough sleep because he can't be on his back for too long. You know, he can't go on long road trips or sit and watch a, a two hour movie. It would hurt too much. Mm. That was around the time where I was figuring out all this stuff and reading about the plant paradox, Dr. Stephen Gundry, that plants don't want to be eaten. They defend themselves by putting out those chemicals. And I was like, you know what? you eat spinach, maybe it's the spinach that you should cut out. Let's try, just try and see that. Cut it out. We didn't even realize that the pain went away. And, and he just, because it wasn't like he was complaining every single day. Like it would be like one week was really bad. And then other weeks when it was like, be, it'll be fine. But it was consistent for like nine, 10 years. Yeah. Eventually, Eventually, um, one day we had forgotten about it. We came back from the beach, passed by Publix. He grabbed a bag of Publix because he hadn't had a, a bag of, not a bag of Publix, a bag of um, spinach because yeah. he had not had it in a long time. He just wanted something different than meat. Like in an instant, everything came back. Like he wow. was out for three days after that. And that's when we knew for a fact, like, okay, that's, that's, that's it. It's the spinach. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Spinach has aquaporins in it. Those are plant self-defense chemicals. Um, other than the oxalate, oxalates are, are another problem in spinach, but on top of that, they've got aquaporins. So his issue is with the aquaporins because after we figured that out, he ate corn once, once a year because he never eats it, but we went to, uh, for Thanksgiving to North Carolina with his family and ate corn. And the same thing happened after we had thought that we've completely overcome the low back thing. And so now I was like, okay, you can't have aquaporins. So that means spinach, no spinach, no uh, soy, and no um, corn. Mm. It's amazing. Food is medicine, but yeah, you know, a lot of people treat the wrong foods as they should be medicine and they're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That word oxalate, that sounds familiar. Um, that is that a is that an anti-nutrient, if I understand correctly, that's found yes. in plants? Yes. Yeah. So Sally K. Norton is the expert on oxalates. And I'm going, I'm so glad that um, I'm gonna be able to interview her soon on my channel. We're gonna dive into all of that. Um a lot of people don't realize that they are so sensitive to oxalates. Um, they're found in things like sweet potatoes, um, rhubarb, uh, chocolate, um, beer, mm -hmm. and they are a form of plant self-defense uh, chemical, plant self-defense mechanism. Liam Hemsworth, the actor, when he got married to Miley Cyrus. They were both yeah. vegan. She was doing veganism. Now she stopped uh, because I quote what she said on Joe Rogan podcast. She said that her brain literally stopped working. Don't have a working brain anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so Because she wasn't getting fish. She wasn't getting omega threes. So she stopped doing that. And he gave an interview yeah, for Men's Health and he said that he stopped and oh, he said that um, the vegan diet gave him a kidney stone and he had to get surgery. And if you know anybody who's got kidney stones, it's one of the most painful things that one can go through. I had one when I was pregnant with our son. It was awful. There you go. Yeah. yeah. No fun. So, so yeah, he would have like a spinach and almond milk um, smoothie in the morning. And both of those things are like oxalate bombs. Spinach yeah. and almonds are the two top foods highest in oxalate content. So yeah, that green smoothie that people love to have in the morning. 
probably the worst thing you can do. Seriously. Yeah. You, you know, it's, it's funny that you, that you mentioned spinach because that makes a lot of sense. I used to eat spinach salads and green salads quite a bit just because everybody says that you should. And so I'm like, all right. And so I'm eating green salads. And then I switched from, I think we, I think it was just because of cost or because like the spinach wasn't good or something. No, so, last year. The- excuse oh, me, honey. I'm still sorry. talking. Um, and so we switched over to iceberg lettuce which has no nutritional value. And we have relatives, yeah. like, no, there's no nutrition in that. Right. And I'm like, yeah, but there's worse nutrition in the green stuff. And I feel better when I eat just literally iceberg lettuce. Yeah. Yeah. I, iceberg actually is very low in anti-nutrient content compared to spinach. 100%. Actually the yeah. darker, like the dark green leafy vegetables are the worst in terms of concentration of those kinds of stuff. Lettuce is, I'm not going to say, harmless because I used to say avocados are harmless. Um, and then I realized they have something called person in them, which is another anti-nutrient. So again, no, like no, no plant wants to be eaten, you know? And so, yeah, I'm maybe in the future, I haven't even looked into the research. Maybe in the future, I'll be like, well, lettuce has that too. But from what I know so far, I would say that, yeah, lettuce is the least harmful for sure. It was so funny on your interview with Chris Bell, where you were talking about fiber and he was, and he was like, yeah, I have fiber from time to time. And you were like, I mean, it's better than going to McDonald's. Like I just died laughing. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was so well said. Yeah. 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 And nothing but respect to Mark, by the way. I mean, just, we know who we're talking about here. Oh, um, no. I, yeah. Chris Bell, right. sorry. Get the two confused. I know. So we do have a question from one of our clients about vegetables for you. Um, so since we're on the topic, if that's okay, if I ask it, um, this yes, is from Osama and he has been, uh, how long has he been carnivore or okay. keto? Osama, he's been our, he's been off and on keto slash carnivore for the last two years. He's been a client of ours for like five years Yeah, in Seattle, I, Washington. Yeah. And so he's um, just wondering like if there are any vegetables that you eat. And I feel like I already know the answer to that question. And then he was just saying that he likes to eat salad and cauliflower rice. So, you know, if there, there are any hurt in eating those when while on the carnivore diet. So not everybody is equally sensitive to those plant foods, right? Um, some people can eat all the veggies and they're great. You know, they're not, it does, they don't have any health ailments. So the question is, does that person have any kind of autoimmunity? Do they have um, any kind of skin issues, psoriasis, vitiligo, eczema, uh, acne, adult acne is on the rise. Do they have uh, soreness, aches and pains after their workouts and they feel like they have to have more recovery or they like for me on carnivore, I don't even need a recovery day. I don't take a recovery day. Whereas when I was doing keto, I was constantly thinking, is it time? Because I'm feeling achy. <laughs> yeah. So um, it depends. Is, is he complaining about anything? Maybe, maybe even a little bit less energy. You know, all those things could be due to consuming the the cauliflower remember cauliflower and broccoli are a very very recent addition to our food supply they have been hybridized from the toxic mustard plant there is a reason why mustard oil is illegal to be sold in the united states it's a toxin yeah say that again i didn't even know that yeah, yeah. So they've hybridized it to make all of the cruciferous veggies on the market, actually cabbage, um, bok choy, um, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, and cauliflower. All of those are derived from the same plant. Yeah. That especially broccoli and cauliflower, well, actually, especially broccoli, I'm not sure cauliflower when it became popular to consume in the States, but I do know that for broccoli, um, less than hundred years we started eating in, in the United States yeah they uh, some uh, some Italians brought it over from Italy where it was consumed and started cons- and, and started growing it in the states in the early 1900s but it didn't take off until like the mid 1950s when we we're told that that's a health food and people actually started eating more broccoli so very recent addition we haven't had enough time for our bodies to adapt to that environmental change without it affecting us negatively yeah. and you've got way too many compounds in those cruciferous vegetables that are not re- very good uh, flat out harmful for our thyroid health um erucic acid which is a toxin you know etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah mm-hmm. well and i know for us we can't eat broccoli broccoli does not agree with us um, but we 
eat call we've eaten cauliflower but it's always been cooked it's always been air fried and so mm. I think that definitely changes things like if I were to eat raw cauliflower first of all I don't know anybody who'd like to do that anyways savage yeah <laughs> But um, well, it's good with the ketchup and mayo. <laughs> My mom used to make it for us when yeah. we were growing up, like a dip. Yeah, cocktail sauce. Oh, that's funny. Not yeah. recommended. Yeah. Well, we'll mm-hmm. have to ask him that because I know for sure, like he's a little bit more sensitive to certain things, and I'm then indifferent than I am. So I think that'll just be good questions. That to man ask loves it. his cauliflower rice, though. Does he? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe it doesn't bother him. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, he might be able to tolerate it. You know, there are so many things that influence whether or not somebody can tolerate those foods. If they've been breastfed, the longer you've been breastfed, the thicker that um, gut lining is and the more yeah. defenses you have. So you don't actually absorb those anti-nutrients where they can do damage. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't been taking antibiotics, so if you've generally been healthy, didn't take antibiotics, or you don't take pain medication like a leave on a regular basis, all those things damage the gut lining. Yeah. If that's the real issue. Having that damage to the gut lining is when you start having a leaky gut where things can cross over and cause issues. So sure. he might be fine. And if that keeps him consistent at the end of the day, it is the consistency that matters most. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll, make, I'll make sure to also ask him how long he was breastfeeding with his mom and then <laughs> <laughs> hey it's a legitimate question my husband was breastfed for three years doesn't know what a headache is has oh, no idea God. what a headache is no 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 health oh. problems whatsoever it's amazing you know like you're a genetic freak I hate you no, <laughs> no that's <laughs> magic gold right there yeah. yes exactly we're fans we're fans of breastfeeding we're friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, he supports you, in his, uh, you know, with his soul, right? Yeah. And your thoughts. Oh, we better, yeah. We better keep this rated PG. All right. <laughs> you want to go into these? Yeah. Cool. So first question is from Jonathan Griffiths, who we found out because of you interviewing him. So thank you again for that. Sure. And that probably had something to do about how we all got connected, but that's kind of the nice thing about that. I found out about you from Jonathan. Okay. There we go. Yep. That's how, yeah. Yeah. But the, then I reached out to you, right? I, I emailed you for an interview mm-hmm. that, yeah, that's how it, that's how it happened. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's just, you know, this, it's only the low carb community. It's, it's like the low carb keto carnivore, everybody kind of has each other's backs and there's, the science is coming out, but there's not like as much because there's just, um, I think it was you that was talking about this too on, on one of your other podcasts. I don't remember which one, but about how there's, there's just no money in selling steak. You know, it's, it's like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of money in, in all these vegan processed foods and like all these, yeah. all these workarounds and everything. Cause but, it makes but, people sick. Yeah. But like yeah. the government doesn't want us to be healthy. The government wants us to be sick so they can fix yeah. us. And, and here's the problem. thing. It's not like the government doesn't want us to be healthy. See, it's like the politicians, they want to get elected okay. for them to get elected. They need money. Because nobody's going to elect an unknown, right? So to be able to become known, you need campaign money. Mm -hmm. And so they have to accept money. Well, they don't have to. They just do (laughs) accept money from everywhere. Who has the most amount of money? The food companies, especially the addictive food companies, because since we have over 80% overweight and obesity rates in the United States, that means over 80% of us are eating addictive foods, right? So that's the sector that has the most amount of money. And so they can afford to give money to the politicians' campaigns. Same thing with the pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, like the whole system works on that addiction model. Mm -hmm. So now the politicians get elected. It's not like they intentionally want to harm us or harm their children but they justified it's like that's the only way I can get elected I'm a politician and they've given me the money so now I kind of have to tread carefully this is what happened when the Obamas were in um, were elected and Michelle Obama if you I don't know if anybody's listening watch fed up documentary it came out in 2014 they talk about the politics behind it it's one of the best documentaries I make my students watch it every semester so when she, so they talk about it in the documentary where um, she got elected, they got elected and she was, uh, she took on obesity as a cause, as a first lady's cause and wanted to go after that. And she called it 
um, let's move campaign. And let's move was meant to evoke action against the whole food environment. She wanted to do something completely revolutionary, like completely rethink the foods we're giving our children. So of course they freaked out all the food companies when they heard her talk about it. So seriously. Yeah. So they volunteered to help. <laughs> so they started meeting with her. And from that to the conclusion of what happened, it changed the, the whole let's move campaign changed slowly but surely into activity let's get our children active it's not about whether or not you want to force them to eat your their veggies it's about having them to uh you know getting them to move Be and uh, you know she very quickly realized that she can't really do that much change and so very quietly changed that so it's you're going up against a lot of influence, money, and power, you know. So yeah. politicians aren't aren't multimillionaires, you know. A lot of them, th that's their job, but it's not like they have billions of dollars to be able to not take that money, you know. That that's that's how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and you know the, the keto community, the carnivore community, we get accused of like having like a cult mentality or something. But whenever I talk to someone that is also has 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 the same views on nutrition it's like i feel like we've known each other our entire lives and like i feel like i know you and i feel like we and i feel like you and i trust each other and we do and, and you know jonathan yeah. same thing and you talk to i mean the own the 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 inventor of the biosense breath ketone monitor uh jim howard you know it's like somebody like that willing to just drop everything he's doing and give us his time and and, and help us understand how the device works and why he invented it it's like yeah, you don't you don't see that level of camaraderie and people having each other's backs in 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 very many different industries. So yeah, because we feel like we're a minority, you know. So oh, we are. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, all right, like this is and the truth. Should. This is what's working, and we're we're the ones that are honest about like what's working and what's not. So like people need to hear this message, you know. Exactly, and when we get censored, it gets us even closer together. That's yeah. good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, Mr. John. So, on that note, uh, Mr. Jonathan would like to ask: Do you, Dr. Sarah, have a competition coming up in competitive physique? You have a wonderful physique. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jonathan. First of all, hi, Jonathan. It's been a while. <laughs> um, I don't have a competition planned. I haven't. No, like I haven't signed up. I did sign up once a long time ago, um, but but not. Like, I don't have any, but I know because I, I told Jonathan that I am thinking about it, but I still have not. Trust me, once I do, everybody's going to know because I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to tell the world that like, that's it. That's the show that I'm going to do and prep starts today, you know, but yeah, not, not just yet, oh. but it's something I am extremely, I always have my, you know, my, my, uh, my eyes on that. So good. Well, we're excited yeah. when that day comes. Yeah. <laughs> Have you noticed any, this is also from Jonathan, have you noticed any difference in dreams, like your like sleep quality uh, since being on the carnivore diet? Have your dreams changed at all? Have my dreams changed at all? I generally sleep very well. Um, the thing that I would say I've noticed with sleep is that I need less sleep yeah. with carnivore. Um, but with dreams, yeah, I don't generally like, Oftentimes I don't even remember my dreams. You know, I'm yeah. such a deep sleeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like, yeah, that's just something that I noticed, but definitely like less sleep needs. Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Glenn Cook from Vancouver, Washington asked, he says that AARP claims that the ketogenic diet is extremely unhealthy for organs, longevity, et cetera. He, and they, they just kind of ranted on the ketogenic diet. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, well, so did the American Heart Association and they still do up until now. They're, they're trying to weasel their way back into the keto community by publishing a, an article um, updating their recommendations for diabetes treatment and saying that keto can also be healthy for heart health and for those uh, who have diabetes. So the problem with those large organizations from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics to the American Heart Association to the AARP is that 
the reason we hear about them, the reason why they're influential is because they accept a lot of sponsorships and money and they work yeah. hand in hand with the food companies and the pharmaceutical companies. And so when you, the, the sheer amount of money that I could be making right now, if I accepted every food company that sends me an email for a sponsorship, I'd be set. But I don't because I don't accept 99% of the requests that I get. And that's because if I don't believe in it, there's no amount of money you can pay me to promote something I don't believe in it. And even if somebody thinks that they can do that, your audience won't buy it. People can see right through you, whether or not you're saying the truth or you're lying. Yeah. So, so the reason why we hear about them, I mean, remember, the, for example, great example, the American Heart Association was a series of literally like six cardiologists that got together and put their organizations together. Nobody had heard of the AHA. They weren't on the map until Procter & Gamble, their PR firm in the early 1900s decided that they wanted to expand their market for the engine lubricants that they were selling, specifically cotton seed oil. They figured we're doing this, uh, the cotton production, but we've got the oil that is that we're throwing away. What if we can make money off of the waste product? Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah, so they chose the American Heart Association's um, grant application. They chose them from their charity arm. Like, who are, who are they going to give money to as charity? So they chose the AHA's um, proposal. And the agreement was that Procter & Gamble gave the American Heart Association $1.5 million. That's way back in the early 1900s. Like, that was a lot of money. And in, in exchange, the American Heart Association started promoting the cottonseed oil and all the other industrial seed oils, also known as engine lubricants, as healthier fats than animal fats because animal fats were the competition back then because that's what we used to use to cook. Yeah. So I think that tells us everything we need to know about those large organizations, institutions that can can go ahead and say that the ketogenic diet, which is the diet that we ate for 99.99% of our existence as a species here on earth is now all of a sudden responsible for modern diseases that weren't there back then. Yeah. I saw it makes no sense. And and, um, okay. Just as a, um, as a exclamation point to what you just said as a, as a personal testimony, there's a difference between like I've eaten the exact same macros and I, and I, and I do this a lot. Um, but I'll eat the exact same macros with nuts and like plant-based sources before a workout. My workout is terrible. I will eat the exact same macros and it's eggs, bacon, and it's meat-based fat sources. I'm eating the exact same amount of fat and my workouts are great. My uh, mental clarity is there. I don't feel bloated. Um, I get a good pump. My energy is better. There's something, and it just makes common sense when, like, when you look at a nut and the and the fat that's in it and what you're eating, that's that's a plant. And when you're eating an animal, the fat that's in the animal is just it's just more similar to your own body fat, and it just makes common sense that your body would be able to better recognize it and know what to do with it. One hundred percent agreed. Yeah, well put. Money speaks. If that if we've learned anything, it's like money. Money is the all powerful thing that speaks in our world. And the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. But what I was going to say though is, um, I think Sean Baker posted this, and I'm probably going to butcher it, but it was basically like, um, the most consumed foods that we have today, and you know, in the American society, are new as of the last sixty years. They've been created in the last sixty years. You know, not outside of like a carnivore based diet. And 60% of the diseases now are, were never existent before then. And it's because of those foods, but people don't make that correlation that they get, that they get sick from the food as they eat. And that autoimmune comes from things that you're consuming. I mean, not all the time, but most of the time it is. And I noticed that with both of our kids who, after I stopped breastfeeding, I stopped breastfeeding them around like 20 months for each of them and, um, their eczema like both of them have struggled with eczema, specifically our son. But around that time when I weaned them and I transitioned them to just regular store milk, 
that has a ton of sugar in it and that isn't good. Um, their eczema just took off and I wasn't like, we were, we were at that time paleo, but you know, with an asterisk, but for our kids, cause we're like, oh, we don't need to put our kids in the paleo diet, but it is amazing how their eczema flares up when they have things that are not like that they shouldn't be having. Like when they have yeah. bread or when they have potatoes besides yeah. sweet potatoes crackers. and they crackers. Goldfish. Yeah. And so the last, like, did you say fish? Goldfish. Goldfish. <laughs> like, uh, oh. like crackers. <laughs> That can't be right. I mean, let alone it affecting, you know, their, their selves, like their skin, but it affects their attitude. It affects them mentally. It affects just how they act. And so, um, it's like food is just, it can be a very positive thing, but it can also be a very extremely negative thing. And most of the society is like, well, you need to have balance in your life when you need to eat sugar and don't, don't cut yourself short and whatever. Just enjoy your life. And I just think it's the dumbest thing. (laughs) Yeah, like your body. 100%. Guess who loves that message? All the food companies. Mm -hmm. They love promoting the balance is key message, right? It doesn't matter where your calories are coming from. As long as you count your calories. I had a conference, a continuing education conference um, back when I was still in Lebanon, completing my uh, master's degree in, in nutrition dietetics. And they held a nutrition conference. And uh, it was at the American University of Beirut, which is like a very prestigious university there. And <laughs> it was sponsored by Coca-Cola. And ah. after everybody gave their presentations, the spokesperson for the for Coca-Cola, she was a Turkish medical doctor. So I guess she did like the Middle East region. And she would come at the end and she did her presentation to close it up and the whole idea was that it doesn't matter if you're drinking coca-cola as a matter of fact coca-cola is a great beverage because it allows you to meet your hydration requirements i kid you not oh no yes and then they wouldn't take any of our um questions at the end so of they had course. They, yeah <laughs> they had like two students they're like okay you're gonna ask and you're gonna ask this question because once she finished all our hands went up like we wanted to grill her you know i mean yeah a bunch of dietitians and you're telling us that like come on but it's yeah it's money and i'll never forget in college um i was studying uh nutrition in college and then they dropped the program but my one of my first nutrition classes off the bat was taught by a very overweight unhealthy person and the first day she said that it doesn't matter if you get your calories uh, for your daily's worth of calories for from twinkies or from whole foods it just matters about how much you're eating and i just was so mad do you were, were we dating at that point yeah, in time you me that. oh my gosh i was so like livid with that and i just cannot believe that yeah. things like that are even taught it just, you know, if it fits your it's macros. So wrong. Yes. No, I, it took me a long time, unfortunately, to learn the lesson. Never take advice from people you don't want to end up like, whether that's in fitness or in mm-hmm. financial, whatever it is, you know, that person who's telling you what to do, they better have it together. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's why, that's why you have the the loyal following that you that Absolutely. you have, Dr. Sarah. I mean, the, and the the short amount of time that we that we've known each other, is something that I've noticed about your YouTube channel and 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 your, and your followers on Instagram, like you have a huge loyal like tribe. I mean, like these people trust yeah. you and, and what you're saying, and it's because you're not only an expert on all this, but you walk the walk. I mean, you literally live it and put all of this into action and. We didn't exactly see, find that at Eastern Washington University. Go Eagles. No. Yeah. yeah. No. Most academic programs, by the way, most professors are not, do, are not really because, you know, an economics professor who's telling you how to run your finances, if they really, if they had made it, they wouldn't be a professor getting paid yeah. 70 to 100K. Yes. <laughs> and like, so let's remember that. Yeah. And like all of our friends that are taking business classes and I'm like, I know, but some of the best business experience I've ever had is just learning from somebody that did it. He was never a professor, you know, right. The moment you apply things, the theory goes out the window. It's it's like 99% of the theory I was taught was wrong. Mm -hmm. And the only way I found out is because I did not give up on applying it. I applied it and I applied it again and again, and and I kept tweaking it. It's like, this has to work. And and then you realize like, no, (laughs) the whole recipe is wrong. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. What's theory and what's put into action, you know, like there's, 
at Eastern Washington University, I, I was playing with some of the most gifted uh, jazz Im improvis Im improvisationalists. Is that a word? Um, <laughs> imp imp improvisers. Some of the most gifted musicians I've ever played with in my life. And I knew theory 10 times better than any of them did. But what mm -hmm. makes mathematical sense and what I can like write down on paper and transcribe and, oh, okay, if you want to put this from a bass clef to a treble clef, blah, 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 it just means everything goes two lines up or down or whatever. It's like, there's, there's that. And then actually being able to be a proficient musician and make a living out of, out of it. And there's it's just a big yeah. difference. There. It's the same thing. In yeah. Music. Some of the biggest stars, they, they barely know any music theory. They just go with the emotion, you know, yeah. and, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Most, most famous guitar players can't even read sheet music. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. yeah. And then you have um, people like Bill don't, Gates. Don't even get us started on, on vocalists. I'm sorry. <laughs> But then you have people like Bill Gates, and, I, and then we can be off this topic, I yeah. promise. But Joe Rogan had the best clip on Instagram a few days ago, and it was like, I would never take health advice from this guy. He's fat. He has man boobs. He has this huge belly, and he looks like he's 90 years old. Why would anybody ever take health advice from this man? And I'm like, yes. Uh, <laughs> I was cool. listening to that podcast. It was with um, Diana Rogers and yeah. Rob... It's been the paleo guy, um, Rob, yeah. Wolf. Rob Wolf, I think is his name. All I saw yeah. was the clip and I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I was literally two days ago, I was listening to it, that same thing in the morning. Yeah, and he was like, yeah, I mean, dude, you're sick. Don't tell me what I should be eating or that I should be eating bugs. Come on. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 And, and just for the record, we're not fat shaming anybody. We're not, you, you know, if, if it's... no. Just saying that if, if, if you're look where you take advice from, yeah, you know, like speak on what you're qualified for. Otherwise, you like, know. Exactly. exactly. No, <laughs> yeah, no, the, the whole fat shaming thing is, I think has gotten out of hand. Like now to state that obesity is a disease, you're basically fat shaming. And I shared something on my story the, the other day on my Instagram, um, a woman who, and I follow this page for female empowerment, like female bosses or something like that. So it's all about, you know, female, like strong women and stuff like that. And, and for the most part, it's great messaging, you know, but then there's also this other thing that, you know, being overweight and obese is healthy. And so this one, they posted that and I reshared it. I'm like, when we start redefining what is healthy, like being bloated and having like a lot of excess body fat and calling that healthy. That's why when we had, you know, what happened two years ago, I'm not gonna, don't worry, we're yeah. not gonna get censored. <laughs> um, and you would read the articles, like perfectly healthy couple, like in the, in the ER fighting for their health. I'm like, mm, and then you, they show their picture. I was like, really? That's yeah. perfectly healthy. You know, just yeah. because you're not taking insulin shots and you don't have like an end stage disease doesn't mean that you're healthy, you know? Absolutely. So, exactly. Yeah. Everybody makes such a big deal about all these bodybuilders that are dying. And I'm like, yeah, like you could make a case for that for, for any group of people. Like people die. That's what people do. Okay. As soon as you're born, you start dying. And most bodybuilders that I know personally are very, very healthy people. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're now, if you're taking, if you're taking drugs, I'm not an expert, so I don't know the side effects. So that might explain it. Uh, but yeah, if you're natural, I mean, I, I live with one, so I know how healthy that can be. Yeah. 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 All right. <sighs> that was a good rant. Let's settle down a little bit after that. <laughs> Okay, this is this this will be a day brightener. Uh, Jenny Ensley from Butte, Montana. She is one of our clients. She is a fitness. Um, She's a personal trainer too. Instructor herself. Yep. She would like to know how do you determine what your sodium requirements are. So, definitely not the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics upper limit of what two thousand three hundred and twenty five milligrams of sodium allowance per day. That's like literally the amount of salt, um, the amount of sodium found in a teaspoon of salt. Oh, That's man. the recommendation, right? That you shouldn't go above that. That is a, or sodium is a problem only within the context of carbohydrates. Cause when you're eating carbs and your body releases insulin, that causes your kidneys to retain electrolytes like sodium. Yeah. And um, then that becomes a problem. 
But even then, it's like only 10% of the population. I remember I had a professor um, back when I was doing my master's. That that was all he did. Like he was, he researched um, minerals and electrolytes, right? And he was like this whole idea with salt being a problem. And even, even within a context of a carbohydrate high, a moderate carbohydrate diet or a high carbohydrate diet, it's still not a problem because only 10% of the population is what we call sodium sensitive. But even if, let's say you are part of that 10% that is sodium sensitive and your body reacts to it. Once you cut out the carbohydrates, you, this is why we see blood pressure normalizing so quickly on a ketogenic diet and a carnivore diet, because the moment you remove the carbohydrates, your kidneys no longer retain that sodium or the, all, all the other electrolytes. Wow. And so it, your blood pressure drops very quickly. I have a client right now and like one of the biggest disclaimers I'm like, you have to measure your blood pressure every day, multiple times a day, because now you're doing carnivore, you're not going to be having to take your blood pressure medication anymore very soon. Make sure your doctor knows so you can taper it very quickly so that you don't have very low blood pressure. Because if you have normal blood pressure now, and you're still taking the hypertension pill, so now that can lead to a very low blood pressure, right? It's a problem. Yeah. So yeah, don't worry about the sodium. If anything, I urge you to add more sodium because that's how you're going to have more energy. It's actually great pre-workout when you're doing carnivore or yeah. keto even. Yeah. Exactly. It gives, yeah. It leads your body to retain also the water. And so when you have more water in your body, so your blood volume goes back up again and it fills your blood vessels. So your blood pressure goes to a normal range. So not too high, but not too low. And that is going to give you energy and you're not going to feel lethargic. That's the whole idea behind the keto flu, right? Keto flu is you go from carbs to no carbs, your blood pressure drops, blood volume goes down. You can prevent that simply by making sure you start including way more sodium and electrolytes and fluids on a carnivore or keto diet. So yeah. bone broth is a great thing. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Very well said. Thank you so much for that. And sure. yeah, the, wow. The, what's recommended. I had no idea. I mean, I literally dry scoop that like just to get going during the day. And then like, I'm, I was I'm just thinking that's into... like half of what you put in your cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. It's, it's just like the, the, the more, the better is what my last bodybuilding coach and he, and he's not even a keto fanatic at, at, at all anyway, but he was saying that so, the more salt, the better. Yeah. What's... So you put scoops of salt in your coffee. Yeah, we both well, do. Yeah, I put salt like literally in in everything. His huge water jug is salt water with mm. lemon. Interesting. That he drinks. And, but in the coffee, it brings out the flavor. It's really good. Like I, uh, we use Celtic the, sea salt. The muscle pumps are great. Like it's yeah. so important for a good workout. Yeah, we use Celtic sea salt it. in our coffee, and it's super smooth. And so it just it tastes so good. It brings the flavor out of the coffee. So I do like two finger pinches. I don't know how much you do probably a lot more because you're more used to it and i need to start tracking it now yeah i haven't gotten there yet yeah we're just getting onto the redmond's real salt mm. or real salt or whatever just straight sodium yeah but yeah also sea salt has um twice as much potassium as sodium yeah uh-huh okay yeah. Mm. yeah the more potassium you take in the more sodium you excrete so that's okay. another this, yeah so that's another thing if you like you might feel if it's too much potassium versus sodium you might feel like you need more sodium so i think it's just testing it out and seeing how you feel your best so that you know how much sodium your body would want generally i would i would recommend go to the most natural source available so like you were saying redmond sea salt mm -hmm. himalayan pink salt they're actually they're the same redmond sea salt and Himalayan pink salt, they're the same. The only difference is really geography, where they're getting it from. Oh, wow. Well, that's good yeah. to know. They look the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And that, that makes a lot of sense, too, what you're saying. Robert Sykes um, recommends a two-to-one as, as a ballpark, like, just kind of to get started. Um, right. Sodium, the potassium, so. Right. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, Jenny would also like to ask, what, what are some normal, abnormal things to expect when transitioning to carnivore? She actually um, has experienced just a, a dry mouth. Hmm. Yeah, that, that might be all the meat. that might be dehydration. Um, and that might also be if you continuously are still having coffee. Um, that can like those things that were present probably before and now you feel them more. Yeah. Because you're more in tune with your body. Um, but yeah, I 
I think just drink more water, but before you drink more water, I think cut out anything that messes with your thirst signals and caffeine is a big one. Um, so caffeine is found in coffee and tea. Yeah. Excellent. Um, do you ever add fats besides what's in your meat in your diet, such as like MCT oil? No, I try to stay away from plants just in general. And, um, there was a time when I was doing keto, I would do MCT oil, but now I know I just, uh, and another thing, I, I don't drink coffee anymore. So it's been over six months now without any caffeine. So wow. it's not like I'm having a beverage where you can add that to. Yeah, no. So what I do is just um, cream cheese uh, or sour cream. Thank or butter. Yeah, or butter. Yeah, if, if I need to. And yeah. I try not to overdo it. I prefer to get excess fat from fattier meat, you know? Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris McQueen from Newport, North Carolina would like to ask, can the carnivore diet help with neurological issues? Oh, 1000%. I mean, I had an interview with Dr. Anthony Chafee that's on my um, YouTube channel where he talks about his experience with his father developing Parkinson's disease. And once he put him on a carnivore diet, like all the symptoms literally reversed. And he was already at a very advanced age. Wow. And I mean, just go to rivero.com, the Sean Baker's website, where they have the success stories. And you'll see just mind blowing success stories on all kinds of neurological issues. I mean, everything, because everything for the most part comes down to autoimmunity. Exactly. Your own body. Yeah. Your own body's immune system is freaking out and starts attacking different organs, whether that's the nervous system or other organs in your system. Yeah. Have you ever had anybody that you've worked with that has had Crohn's disease and that you've helped them with like going from carnivore while on Crohn's? I had a student, so it wasn't like it was a paid consult, but I have students also that I help, you know, just by emails and stuff that, 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 complete like this is one of the easiest things actually Crohn's and digestive issues yes I've had that I've had uh, on a regular basis the bloating goes away once they go on carnivore um yeah so in that case we actually have we've just started working with a couple high school students and one of them was just diagnosed with Crohn's he's what 15 14 15 uh, Calvin excuse me I was was good yeah it's Calvin. Calvin Calvin's the older one he's 14 He's 14. Yeah. So he was just diagnosed with Crohn's and I think they're being sent to a nutritionist. And so we would just, we just said that we'd talk to you to see if you have any suggestions with him either going keto or carnivore. Cause I'm not sure what the nutritionist recommended. But carnivore. Just- no, no, I wouldn't do keto. I would do carnivore because yeah. ulcerative colitis, that's autoimmune. The first yeah. thing you want to do is eliminate all plants, everything. Yeah. Okay. All, yeah. Even herbs and seasonings, I would cut those out. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. That was, that was uh, Katrina's question. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Cool. All right. I think that's pretty much it. Um, I got one. <laughs> that's all right. So Go ahead. great. Um, so I was studying your, your apple cider vinegar video, which the science on it, like you have an ability to take what's extremely complicated and still use all the same terms, but somehow explain it in a way that my bicep brain can um can, can oh, understand it. thank you sometimes I'm, i worry that i use too much jargon or you know so thank you for saying that well you're very animated in how you talk and i think most of the research that i try to do it's just like so monotone and boring and i can't focus on it i'm like what the heck but like when like you you bring like your feelings and your passion into it and everything and like i don't know it just it just really sticks so thank you uh, no thank you so uh, when it comes to apple cider vinegar i've been um, taking a shot of it every single morning, the same one, I think Bragg's or whatever the one that you it's, recommend. Yeah, that's the best. Okay. Bragg's unfiltered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've been taking that and, and I've, and, and my, um, bodybuilding coach has always sworn by it too. And especially like if I wake up feeling bloated, cause I usually eat a pretty big meal, like right before bed. And so like I'll wake up and still kind of feel the food digesting. And if I ever feel too bloated or like I got less sleep and it hasn't had time to really all digest yet, take a shot of apple cider vinegar. And it's like five minutes later, I feel great. And I almost feel like I have an empty stomach. And so I can take my dog out, go for a run and everything. Um, and I mean, just like for overall health, I, I, I really enjoy just one shot of apple cider vinegar first thing in the morning. I've been doing that for a while. However, in uh, January of this year, stressful month, a lot of stuff going on, um, but, f- but found myself in the hospital with a stomach ulcer. 
and uh, was like the worst pain of my life. Like literally thought I was going to die. If I had my gun with me, I literally would have shot myself in the foot just to get my mind off of how bad my stomach hurt. Like I would, I I would take that over it. Like that's how bad it was. Um, So stopped taking apple cider vinegar. And since then I've kind of started doing it a little bit, but I remember you saying that it can damage your stomach lining. So yes, and your tooth enamel. Yeah. yeah. Curious if you have any, any suggestions. Yeah, don't. Don't do that anymore. As a matter of fact, that's, uh, I should probably film another video. I have older videos sometimes like on honey and I was like, honey, Manuka honey is wonderful. And then I updated that and I'm like, no more honey, everybody. <laughs> Stop doing that. So I guess I should update the, also the apple cider vinegar. Yeah, I would not recommend it anymore for anybody. The the, the reason why there's so much, um, or or the the one area where you could take vinegar is if you have a real damage to your liver for whatever reason it's been shown that it can regenerate liver cells we call them hepatocytes so it regenerates them and uh helps helps them detoxify so that only if we have like a very specific case but even with that i think we can do those things in better ways because like you said you suffered an ulcer not only that a over time, it's going to erode the enamel on your teeth. He already has that. Problem. I already been there. I already got yeah. feelings. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I The only reason why it is so popular is because there is very solid evidence that it lowers your blood sugar levels by like 30%. And so that's, we all want lower blood glucose levels because generally the main problem is that people have too high of a blood glucose level. But how about not eating carbs? <laughs> then we don't need to put acid in our bodies and suffer the consequences. So update, apple cider vinegar, not recommended. And it doesn't wow. taste good anyway. So why do it if you don't have to? I, mean, I certainly won't <laughs> miss it. Huh? I mean, I certainly won't miss it. <laughs> yeah, right. And then the ones that you get from the market, they're pumped with sugar. It's like- Well, and they ha- now they have like apple cider vinegar gummies and capsules and like yeah. everything. I'm like, it's completely canceling any positive side effect when you add sugar. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just, that's just marketing. There's no, no, just cut that out. <laughs> okay, I have one last question and then um, I know it's past the hour, but I was just curious, do you take any vitamins or supplements? Yes, I take vitamin D. Um, and I take magnesium and I take, um, organ beef supplements Nice. and, and, um, the only thing is the omega threes. I'm not doing that right now, but I am having salmon. Yeah. So nice. The omega three is a little more of a complex topic, but yeah, that's what I, and I also, every YouTube video of mine, especially the most recent ones have the updated um, supplementation protocol that I generally think most people will benefit from. Mm. Wow. Um, am I correct in saying that I didn't hear vitamin C anywhere in there? Yes. Yeah. But you don't need it. Um, be, and besides I'm getting it from the beef organs. Remember organ, you're eating organs or taking them as a supplement. That's your natural multivitamin. They have like very high levels of, uh, of all kinds of nutrients. So, and, and besides, once you take out the carbohydrates, your body's needs for vitamin C drop dramatically. And then there's another problem. If you're taking vitamin C supplements that can turn into oxalates, remember the oxalates we talked about earlier, yeah. which are very problematic for a lot of people. Yeah. You do not want to create more oxalates in your body. Wow. So yeah, there's no need. Yeah. Paul Saladino in his, in his book, the carnivore code, Mm. Uh, page 231 apparently there's according to uh, dr saladino there's 25 milligrams of vitamin c in beef liver that's more go. than that's a lot yeah that's that's, so more than, need... that's more than blueberries it's more than kale <laughs> yeah okay yeah um you, but then they would tell you, well, what about um, citrusy fruits, right? And then, and then the answer would be, if you're having citrusy fruits, you're also having the sugar, yep. and then the sugar is going to block. They literally, sugar, or glucose specifically, shares the same receptor with vitamin C. The yeah. more glucose you have, the more it blocks vitamin C. And remember, you're getting vitamin C in milligram amounts versus glucose, you're getting it in gram amounts. In the right. Right. So, uh, the receptors aren't going to absorb the vitamin C. Not only that, you only need more than 10 milligrams to prevent scurvy. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You, you already beat me to, every, to everything I was looking for, but no, uh, Paul, what, no, no. Sean. Sean Baker in his book, The Carnivore Diet, he says everything that you just said too. And yeah, like basically, Great book. yeah. when you drink orange juice or eat anything that is 
citrusy for vitamin C, you're making your body need more vitamin C. I mean, it's literally just you're wasting your time. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's so funny. Every time our kids get sick, my grandma, she's like, give them some more oranges, give them some more, you know, vitamin or vitamin C. And I'm like, not in the forms that they have at the store. Like, no, thank you. Like the vitamin C, like vitamins for kids are just full of sugar. It's Mm -hmm. just not worth it. Like, (laughs) yeah, they eat lots of meat where they're good with that. Yeah. One of the one of the asked about the vitamin C too because that's that's the number one question that I always get asked is like well where are you getting your vitamin C where are you getting your vitamin C okay bro here's here's the rundown of vitamin C <laughs> yeah cool there you go nice yeah meet. I have a video on that so if anybody wants like the whole everything all the detail I show you like the the chemical structure of vitamin C and glucose and how they look alike and how they share the same receptor. Um, it's an older one but it's still good. <laughs> I'll have to check that out. I just made a note to not only watch it myself, but to include that in the show notes too. So you'll find a link for it if you're listening. And isn't it funny how when, what we were just talking about that happened two years ago, everybody was saying you know, like, what every like um, natural doctor was saying was to up your vitamin D and to up your zinc. No vitamin C was in there because all the forms of vitamin C were like not usable by your body, so. Oh, I think it's, I'm sorry. I think it was my internet that that wavered for a little bit. So you just oh. literally froze for the last 30 seconds. Oh, I was just saying back when, you know, two years ago happened, about a year into it, uh, and they started noticing that higher levels of vitamin D and higher levels of zinc is what was going to help if you got sick. And yeah. there wasn't any higher levels of vitamin C in there because vitamin C supplements, you know, if you're not getting them from the proper source, they don't work. So... Yeah. Very, yeah, that's good. I didn't even think of that. You're right. But mm-hmm. all the studies that were done showed the vitamin D, how powerful and the zinc, how powerful it was. But of course, yeah. you couldn't say that, right? You were censored if you did, if you bought, right. if you dared to mention those studies. Oh, I know. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Do you have any more questions or? That's that's all I got. Yeah. Right now. I'm so excited for this to come out. I already have a list of people I'm going to send this to because there's a lot of people that have been just intrigued by um your story so i'm excited yeah we got a bunch of responses to the email that we sent out just saying like i don't have anything but let me know when it's out because i can't wait to hear it yeah i'm so glad i'm so excited what's up podcast thank you so much for joining us for this entire interview with dr zaldivar i love saying that name it's so freaking cool (laughs) Um, also If you're listening to this at the time of this recording, then happy Memorial Day. Whatever you're doing this weekend, I hope that you travel safe if you are traveling. If it's after Memorial Day 2022, then well, happy Memorial Day 2023. (laughs) Uh, But seriously though, I'm, I'm feeling super grateful and I would encourage you to feel the same way because you know, a lot of our listeners listen to these episodes while they're working out and If you're having a hard time being motivated to finish your workout or struggling with those last couple sets, just want to encourage you to finish strong and to think about this for a second, that there's a lot of people that gave their lives that you have the opportunity to even be in this amazing country to work out in the first place. So that's something that I was thinking about today. I just finished up uh, back, just a little bit of back today. A little bit of a bicep pump, hit shoulders pretty good yesterday, so I didn't have to worry about that. Anyway, that's not your problem, that's my problem. But just wanted to say, um, let that gratitude be something that fuels you in your workout, whatever it is that you're doing. Also, if this episode was something that particularly helped you, please share this with a friend. Think of someone that you know that either likes to eat meat or doesn't like to eat meat, but probably should. I mean, that's basically everybody. So you can just go through your last couple text messages and go, bro, you need to listen to this episode or sister you need to listen to this episode because dr sarah is on the cutting edge of the science and the education that is coming out around the benefits of low carb diets meat-based diets okay super exciting super grateful that we were able to have her time on this show thank you so much everybody for your support eat some meat <laughs> happy memorial day god bless